All right. Um, so I'm Parker Lewis. I write a blog. Some people call it a yacht. Um, but started writing about a year ago. Big fan of Bitcoin. I work at Unchain. I lead our business development efforts. And uh, we're going to jump in today. Yeah. I was driving up on Thursday. And Justin wanted me to talk about the dollar. So I hadn't created a presentation just yet. But I decided if Justin wanted it, Justin gets what Justin wants. Um, so we oftentimes talk about hyper-Bitcoinization, which we all love. It's great. It's fun. We all, or most of us have Bitcoin. Bitcoin fixes everything. There aren't going to be wars. We're going to make a lot of money. It's good. The other side of that, though, is that if we get the hyper-Bitcoinization, it means that the dollar has probably hyperinflated, probably the euro, probably the yen. We don't talk about it a lot because it's the scarier side of the other equation, but um, that's what I'm going to talk about today. But hopefully not in a way that scares and terrifies everybody and leaves them here leaving depressed, but that you'll be excited and optimistic and will feel good about it. A couple things I'm going to talk about are that risk happens fast. Um, there's this idea that we don't want to think about the other side of hyper-Bitcoinization uh, because we think it could never happen to me. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the efficient market hypothesis and whether or not uh, Bitcoin is priced in and the happening is priced in. Um, and then we'll ultimately get to why Bitcoin is not priced in. Um, I'm well known to be a Fed hawk. And one of the things that Chairman Powell recently did a speech, it was either yesterday or the day before, and uh, one of the quotes was, many find it counterintuitive that the Fed would want to push up inflation. However, inflation that is persistently too low can pose serious risk to the economy. Um, oftentimes, after someone like Chairman Powell will give a speech, I'll come out and there are people ask me questions, what do I think? Um, for me, it's one of those things where they, they keep talking, but it just sounds the same over and over again. Um, and when I see something like, Many find it counterintuitive that the Fed would want to push up inflation. I think, no, Jay, I think we got it. We really got it. We may even understand it better than you do. Um, so we'll jump into that too. Um, so the idea of risk happens fast. I'm going to go through a few examples of these, but I don't know how many people are fans of the movie Old School, but um, it's this idea that, dear Mitch, if you're holding this letter, you already know the house has been boarded up the doors, the windows, everything. We're at the Comfort Inn, room 112. I love you, Frank. Um, if you're finding out that your currency is collapsing on a TV screen, it's too late. It's already happened. And, and more realistically, it happened probably a decade ago. And we're going to talk about information asymmetry. So um, one of the things that I think people have come to, to be readily aware of in the last few years is hyperinflation in Venezuela. But realistically, the currency broke in 2013. And that um, any time that a currency breaks, you will know it. But then the consequences of that will take some time to actually cause full-on and complete failure of the monetary medium. And so we'll, you know, one of the things that I want to highlight here is that when the currency breaks, um, there's this Jeff Bezos quote where he says, you know, friends congratulate me after a quarterly earnings announcement and say, good job, great quarter. And I'll say, thank you, but that quarter was baked in three years ago. If we think about a company like Amazon and their current quarter being baked in three years ago, if, if we're talking about either hyper-Bitcoinization and the probability of that or the, the reality that a currency may collapse and whether it's the Venezuelan Bolivar or the Argentine Peso or the Turkish Lira, or the Lebanese pound, that anything that has happened today was written, if it's in the case of a company three years ago, in the case of a currency, is probably a decade ago. And so what we're thinking about right now has, you know, the effects of it are already written, and we'll see it in the future. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few of these examples because they're one after another. But the key takeaway is when the currency breaks, it's broken, and, and you will be able to see it. So, you know, in the, in the last few months, we've seen the Argentine peso go from 40 to 60, um, a 50% devaluation. But realistically, when the currency went from 20 to 1 to the dollar to 25, at that point in time, if a currency loses 20% of its value in a matter of a week, it's done. Confidence is broken, and you'll be able to identify it. And once confidence is broken, it's Pandora's box. You can't put it back in. 
Um, this is the Lebanese pound, or at least it's the black market rate. And again, I keep highlighting these points of before it really breaks, it's already broken. And then there's some time where people catch up. And that's just the nature of um, people don't realistically come to that conclusion all at once, but you will be able to see it. Um, this is the Turkish lira, same thing. Again, I'm not highlighting the point where it really breaks. It's highlighting the point that, you know, prior to that, and then highlighting the fact that even further back from that is when the history was actually written um, that prevented it from being uh, anything other than inevitable. Um, so this also isn't a new thing, the Mexican tequila crisis. This is back in the 90s. Um, and then also the Russian ruble, which was 2014, 2015. So um, the, the thing that I like to say about all these things, um, again, I'm a big fan of Zoolander. So Ferrari, La Tigre, Blue Steel, it's all the same thing. Um, and if you don't recognize it, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. And the point is that when you start to look and understand fiat currencies, you know, people think about the dollar and the pound and the euro and the yen, maybe even the yuan, and they, they think that something's different between the bolivar or the peso or the lira or the Lebanese pound. Um, but realistically, all fiat currencies are the same and that we are just at a different point on the same curve. We're not on a different curve if we're operating in the dollar world. And so I think sometimes there's some compromise that in order to be sane, we like to communicate, which is, yes, there will be hyper-Bitcoinization, but it will be running next to the dollar. And I just don't really think that that's practical. Um, so a few things to, to, to really highlight, I think that, you know, the idea of how and why currencies collapse, and Marty Bent, I believe, is in the room, but he has, a, you know, says it often and loudly on t Twitter: "Don't f with the money," because what you what you ultimately get is situations that are as predictable as Venezuela, Lebanon, um, Turkey, Argentina, and those will only continue to get worse. Um, but that many people oftentimes associate it with just printing money, and and it's easy to to extrapolate from printing money to hyperinflation to, to economic collapse. Um, but realistically, and it's, it's, a, it's the, the gradually part of it that as the, the central bank is printing money while the currency is still apparently functioning or uh, appears to be functioning, it's degrading. Um, its ability to fulfill the pricing mechanism within an economy is, has been distorted and causes supply and demand structures to, to break down over long periods of time such that then that, that process effectively accelerates once you can actually, once you're actually aware of it. So the printing money via any central bank function does two things. It allows economic imbalance to be sustained and by sustaining that then that e imbalance ultimately is exacerbated. Um, through that process, complex supply chains become distorted. Um, the supply of real goods ultimately declines. And as that occurs, the imply imbalance between supply and demand grows. Um, as more money is created, the, the actual function of money breaks down. Um, real goods become scarce compared to the supply of money, and individuals have a disincentive to hold money, so they begin to create a run on basic necessities. And so they're effectively selling their money because they're not confident that there will actually be goods on the grocery shelves, which is what we see in a place like Venezuela. Um, so when that run on the currency happens, that's when you see that initial break. The Argentine base are going to from 20 to 1 to 25 to 1. The, that once you realize that nobody wants to hold the currency, there's only one way that that goes from there. Um, so then there's this idea of it will never happen to me, right? Where, you know, I, I really tell people to think about, well, what is fundamentally different between the Venezuelan Bolivar and the U.S. dollar? Um, and, I'll, and, and I'll present my um, kind of not theory, but the way that I think about it, but that, that's what I, I tell people, like, really think about what's different about it, because people will come to some explanations. I don't think it will be accurate, but that at least starts the thought process. So the key here, though, is hope is not a strategy, and it will never happen to me is not logic. Why people believe the dollar has value, and I think a lot of people in this room have thought more about this than the average person, um, but there are a few reasons that people give, and that first one, it's a collective hallucination, or hallucinization. Um, the government says it does. The petrodollar, guys with guns, and taxation. 
None of these qualify as economic arguments, um, and, and the critical thing is that a central bank can control the supply of the currency, but they can't make people value it. This, in my opinion, is the single thing that gives any fiat money that exists value. Um, it's why the dollar maintains its value. The dollar has value because people demand it, and that's a very simple concept. You could say, hey, that s sounds a little dense, but the real reason that people demand dollars is because, on average, we're massively short dollars. So on the right side of the page, you can see in the U.S., the dollar-denominated debt, and this, is, this for me is when I think about the dollar system and abstract away to the highest level, there's 78 trillion in dollar-denominated debt. That's not you know, financial crisis, CDO, CDS, derivatives, that's just fixed liability, fixed maturity debt that exists in the United States. And there's only $4.7 trillion. And that's today, after the Fed's printed $3 trillion. So when it, that, this dynamic, the difference between debt and, and the actual dollars, is why the Fed can print a massive amount of money and not have the currency immediately collapse because we are still massively short dollars. So after that happens, each dollar is still owed 16 to 1. So for every dollar that exists, 16 people effectively that have obligations need to demand dollars in the future. And what that really means is if you don't work for dollars, I'm going to take your car, I'm going to take your house, I'm going to take the shirt off your back, and that's one hell of an incentive to work for dollars to pay those debts because the dollar debts are actually secured by productive assets. This becomes a vicious cycle. Um, when I look back to this chart, there's two things that I would say. This is the reason why the dollar has value. It is why people demand it, despite the fact that the Fed creates more of it. Um, but it's also what guarantees that dollars will become less and less scarce over time. So this is my simplified wheel of what happens. Um, and, and I like to say, you know, there's oftentimes debate amongst hedge fund managers, any expert that's willing to, to, to talk says something along the lines of what the Fed has done is crazy, but it had to be done. Um, in reality, my view of it is that QE cannot solve a debt problem and that it actually creates the debt problem. And it was actually QE or the existence of the same thing before QE existed that allowed the problem to become as big as it is today and, and allowed the credit system to, to grow to the size that it is. So what essentially happens is the Fed puts money in the system um, because there aren't enough dollars, because there's too much debt essentially. And when they add those dollars, it's not just designed to sustain the credit system, it's designed to actually induce more credit expansion. Because if we look at this chart, the way that the, the Fed's economy work is, is, is a credit system. The, the credit system is the marginal price setter. So when the Fed has a price stability mandate, they actually have a mandate, even though it's not explicit, to maintain the size of the credit system. That scenario ultimately leads to the, the Fed puts more dollars in, we create more debt, and then there's too much debt, and we go back around the wheel. And so in that, in that way, um, by its ver very nature, in my view, QE is more like heroin than antibiotic, and the more that is applied to a financial system, the more that it needs. Each time the boat gets bigger, they need more dollars to sustain the boat. But if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask you to buy his triple C bonds. <laughs> and that's a reality. And it's dangerous, it's, it's effectively moral hazard, um, and it exists in a big way. And while there is some semblance of kind of an expectation or understanding that if you take an advisable risk that you will be penalized, I think that's probably how all of us live our lives, and it's how most individuals do live there, so it's not to say that everyone just banks on the fact that they're going to be bailed out by the Fed, um, but when you introduce moral hazard that it, it creates broken incentive structures that allow for in aggregate risk taking to happen that, that wouldn't otherwise happen. And um, you know, at the end of the day, if people have the power, m our, our good friend Michael Goldstein couldn't be here, so I had to give him a shout out. But um, it's very simple. If you give people the power to print money, they will print money. And when we think about this dynamic, the reason that they have to is because there's way too much debt in the world. But this whole system got created because they kept bailing out the system out in aggregate. And this is the, uh, the gradually part. So you know, when we think about the dollar and its ability to effectively coordinate its principal function, which is marshalling economic resources, we are seeing the slow decline of the dollar. And that this 
kind of loss of value where oftentimes people question Bitcoin and they say, hey, it's not a good store of value because it's too volatile. And there's a, there's a key distinction that volatility and store of value are not one and the same. And that a good that is seemingly um, not, not vo volatile is not a good store of value. And there was a recent presentation that Goldman Sachs gave where they said, you know, the dollar is a store of value and in 10 years it will be worth 20% less. You know, and so you have the smartest guys in the room not understanding that you know something that loses its value is not a store of value, but the the real damaging part that is when the dollar is distorted as a price mechanism, that imbalances grow and ultimately there is a blow up, and that at some point in time that gradual de decline will break, and confidence is a very fragile thing. So um, within the Bitcoin space, there's a and you know one of the ideas here is that. People don't like to think about this of the idea that, well, why couldn't why couldn't what's happened to the Bolivar, the peso, the Turkish lira, the Lebanese pound, why couldn't that happen to the dollar? And if, if people really kind of question it and whether or not what the Fed is doing right now, and when I think about everything, if we if we think about currency crisis, again, if a company everything that's done today impacts three years from now in the currency system, it's like everything that happened ten years ago at the financial crisis is the history that was written then that's impacting us now and that still isn't priced in um, and we're going to find it out someday so in the bitcoin world oftentimes people hammer about stock to flow is wrong they say the happening is priced in and what i tell those people is if you believe in the efficient market hypothesis i have an economics professorship to sell you at a liberal arts college in antarctica um, the, the efficient market hypothesis is a fool's game um, Information is both imperfect and asymmetric. Um, there is a reality that very few people know that the Fed has printed $3 trillion, and there's also very few people who know that there are only ever 21 million Bitcoin, and there's even fewer people who understand why that is going to be the case, and why can't Bitcoin can't be copied. You can't price that in. So not just is the happening not priced in, Bitcoin's not priced in, but the fact that the Fed printed trillions of dollars after the last financial crisis is in this one certainly aren't priced in because people don't have access to the same information. Um, and ultimately the reason why it isn't priced in is because um, there's two things and people are quickly figuring it out. But um, I use the, the George Bush quote where he says there's an old saying in Tennessee, or at least it is in Texas, uh, fool me once, not going to fool me again. Um, <laughs> and this is the not going to fool me again chart. Um, but it's fool me once, shame on you. Fool me four times, shame on me. Um, and so we've learned, and again, this chart, QE1, QE2, QE3, QE now, what I tell people is, if QE worked, why did you need the second one? Or the third? You know, like, why didn't it fix it? Did it fix it? Did it fix anything? And, and not only does it not fix something, it actually demands or requires that even more of QE happens in the future. So people are figuring this out. I think that the shock and awe of, of what the Fed did, um, it's like ripping the Band-Aid off. Um, and this is just a quote from Paul Tudor Jones when he recently decided to, to buy Bitcoin. He said, it's become, it has happened globally with such speed that even a market veteran like myself was less speechless. We are witnessing the great monetary inflation, an unprecedented expansion of every form of money unlike anything the, the developed world has ever seen. So this guy's been around forever, and QE1, 2, and 3 were all there, and that wasn't enough to wake him up, but then boom, QE now, $3 trillion in a matter of two months. People are waking up, but, but again, even then, information is asymmetric. Um, information is imperfect. So his understanding of it is very different than, than ours in this room, um, as well as the general population, and it takes time for information to spread. And then exhibit B, obviously Bitcoin, 21 million, same guy connecting these two dots. And the reason why I highlight this is because it's very simple. Bitcoin is complicated. It's this chart and this chart. I also made the case for owning Bitcoin, the quintessence of scarcity premium. It's literally the only large tradable asset in the world that has a known fixed maximum supply by its design. The total quantity of Bitcoins cannot exceed 21 million. This at the end of the day is everything. Um, it's why people demand Bitcoin, but also recognize, and it's also why, the, in my view, the dollar collapse is inevitable. Anytime that somebody d demands to store their value in Bitcoin, 
that would otherwise participate in the dollar economy is opting out of this. It's 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 directly competing, and Bitcoin is going to get more and more mind share because of 21 million ever. Um, when I think about that from an economic fundamental perspective, though, it is the value of any good will trend towards its marginal cost to produce. And this, when I you know when I go back to say you know Ferrari, La Tigre, Blue Steel, they're all the same. Um, when I think of you know I can certainly explain readily why the Fed is different than Maduro's Venezuela, um, but the least common denominator about the currency is all fiat currencies have a marginal cost to produce of zero by the central bank. How they choose to do that can be different and they can quote be managed more or less effectively. The end game is the same because of that hard fact and because of the quote that our friend Michael Goldstein said which is if people can print money they will print money. Um, and so when you compare that to the reverse that the marginal cost to produce a dollar or a bolivar or a pound or a yuan or a yen is zero um, and correspondingly that means the supply is infinite. Bitcoin is the opposite. In a terminal state its marginal cost to produce is infinite because at a point in time around 2140 there won't be any more Bitcoin that are that are issued um, and people won't be able to produce any so therefore there's an infinite cost to produce. Those two systems can't coexist. People uh, inevitably will demand one over the other and once a critical mass of people do opt out um, again there are flaws inherent to the to all fiat systems that independent of Bitcoin would cause uh, deterioration like we see in Venezuela or Lebanon um, but then when it's competing with Bitcoin there is a bit better option out there and that's why even though it can be a little bit you know terrifying and depressing to think about the dollars collapse it's not dystopian it's the light at the end of the tunnel um, and that acceptance is the final stage of grief because it's one of those things where it's like well shoot if the dollars gonna you know ultimately collapse and say well if we've been talking about hyper Bitcoinization it's the other side of the same coin. So it's just one side that we don't like to think about. Um, and in my view, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it because Bitcoin is such a big source of optimism. It's, it, it, it is that if Bitcoin didn't exist, there wouldn't be a currency for the whole world to, to fall back to when legacy currencies do fail because those currencies would fail independent of Bitcoin or not. Um, and that with that um, hard money, first form of money that has a finite, scarce, supply that that is what the entire world will shift over to and that will will reboot the global economy and and it really is in, in my personal opinion the the 21 million uh, makes Bitcoin inevitable and it's the light at the end of the tunnel so Pierre also is not here today and you know for him I did run the numbers <laughs> uh, this is not like a COVID model uh, this Th this model is closed sourced. I'm not sharing it with anybody. I'm, I'm being very upfront with that. So um, in 2030, there will be a billion people that have Bitcoin. Um, I have run those numbers. I think you know, maybe a month ago, I was on Jimmy's podcast, and I believe I re-ran the numbers. That we may be at a billion in five years, um, but we're, we're still tooling. It's five to 10 years, billion people on Bitcoin. Um, and and that's ultimately driven by the 21 fix 21 million fixed supply and that I think about Bitcoin as being inevitable because money is a basic necessity um, if when we think about the you know, people having reliable access to food water health care power uh, it's because there's a reliable form of money to coordinate economic resources and facilitate the division of labor um, and that because money is that necessity and because Bitcoin will fulfill that function the best because of a fixed supply uh, the entire world will shift over to it and th and that we only really need one currency so um, my name is Parker Lewis I've only ever bought Bitcoin I've uh, never bought a shit coin and I've never traded on BitMEX so <laughs> I recommend you all do the same So, any questions? <laughs>
Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, great presentation, like full of awesome meat. So you described um, a 10-year lag of being baked in monetary, basically monetary effect of like decisions and things like that. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I mean, again, I okay. don't so, don't make me run the numbers, but well, I was actually, I'm saying the, the point being that the things that are happening right now have been baked in for for far longer than than um, individual companies or individual markets, and that you know, big changing, uh, big difference was the financial crisis, which was 10, 11 years ago. Okay, because I was going to ask you, is there some empirical information showing that 10-year lag? Because that's really interesting. Because if if it's true, then you could you know obviously predict. And, and so my second question would be. Is it going to take 10 years, do you think, for the, this spike up in uh, dollars being printed to really show up, do you think, uh, for the U.S. dollar? Well, what I would say is I think that the, the, the key thing is the relationship between the actual amount of dollars and the, and the dollar credit system. Um, so that, that numerator and denominator, the, the delta will continue to shrink, essentially, by putting more dollars in the system. The Fed delevers the system. Uh, but as more and more people opt out, it is dynamic with Bitcoin. So I, I do look at it as the Fed's going to, to, to have increasing problems because of the, the because Bitcoin's going to accelerate um, the, the collapse of the U.S. credit system, essentially. Uh, people are going to, to sell credit assets in the U.S. to accumulate Bitcoin. That's going to cause the credit system to attempt to collapse, and then people are going to um, the Fed's going to have to increase the supply of dollars more rapidly or on an accelerated basis. So if when we think about 10 years, that's two halvenings from now, or we're going to be in the middle of the, you know, the third halvening from now. Um, so I do think that you know, inflation is going to show up. It's transmitted through the credit system. Uh, there's nothing that the Fed did in, in March or April that's suddenly going to cause you know, hyperinflation. Uh, that is just going to continue to, to probably react similarly to what has happened in the last 10 years, but that with each passing halvening of people opting out of Bitcoin, I would accept, expect that to accelerate. So I don't think that it's unrealistic that in within the next decade that most of the world is operating on Bitcoin. Thank you. Awesome. So the first question would be, what's the time frame for this? Because right now the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency, and Ecuador, Salvador, and I think Cuba also pegs their currency to the dollar, right? So it's it's very intertwined in the global financial system, right? So what would be, do you think it's going to be a gradual, like just people are just going to start opting out and going into Bitcoin, or will there be like some type of watershed moment for these countries to decide, okay, you know what? I don't want to peg my currency to the dollar anymore. I don't want to use the dollar as, as, as the currency of Ecuador or whatever in that example. How is that going to happen, in your opinion? Yeah, so, well, you know, one, timing is the hardest thing to predict. I, I work generally under assumptions that I believe to be true, uh, that I think are fundamentally have indisputable, and then, and then care less about timing, and that's the best way to be able to play through in all conditions. Um, so, kind of in the reality, though, you know, I do think that it's possible that people, again, if they're shifting over to to, to Bitcoin in a way that, you know, if whether we call it hyper Bitcoinization or just say most of the world is operating on Bitcoin, that that reality and world could happen within the next 10 years, um, because it because it is dynamic, um, and because we do see that with each passing, having people's it's what effectively happens is people's understanding and um, confidence in the fact that 21 million is actually a real number um, only gets hardened and hardened with each passing happening and that is that that reality coexists when the dynamics in the credit system dictate that trillions more be put into the system in order to sustain and stabilize asset and general price levels. So again, there's there's nothing special to it. I think if we look at each one of those prior currency collapses, it is that the timing of when confidence breaks is impossible to know. Um, but it but it's it's not triggered by an event. It's not triggered by today we woke up and there was an earthquake and, and the currency collapsed. It was that it was degrading over time and it was degrading because slowly but surely the central bank, 
of the central government was printing more and more of it, and the money was actually doing its function of coordinating and being that price system and price mechanism in the economy worse and worse to the point where the imbalance had grow, grown so large that, it's, again, it's not just a function of printing money. It's that the things that we actually need, that money fulfills, the, the coordination to get those things, it actually degrades to the point where it can no longer um, do that. And the things that we actually need, the goods become more and more scarce, and, and money just entirely deteriorates at that point. So, yeah, I don't want to duck the question, but again, while saying it's impossible, I do think that it is possible that 10 years is a reasonable time frame. Thank you. All right, so I wanted to ask, it, do you think, I've been wondering about how, like, the, the potential to actually, of, is this thing on? I can hear you, guy. Hello, hello. Okay. I got you. Um, uh, how is there actually a route that doesn't end in hyperinflation for the dollar? Because when you look at M2, like the actual expansion of the money supply is with debt, right? So that actually, there's actually a huge pressure to pay that back. And like what we actually saw with like the three trillion dollars printed is that they're not turning around. Like e despite the fact that interest rates are just garbage and they have nothing to do with the real market rate, people are actually changing their behavior when everything becomes uncertain. So what they actually do is they start paying off debts. So we actually lower the actual amount of money in the system because there's not the reserve there to then, for the fractional reserve system to then print more debt on it because people aren't actually spending the money, they're getting rid of liabilities. So uh, I wonder, particularly if it coincides with like some huge bull market in Bitcoin and like 100 million people getting like dumping into it, that people could actually massively work to deleverage and at the, the same time that the, the actual demand for the dollar decreases, that you also have this massive cut in the amount of debt that we actually have because we're trying to step away from the dollar. Oh, excuse me. Um, that we're actually trying to step away from the dollar. So do you think there's actually kind of like a route possible for a kind of a slow, painful way out of this that looks more like the Japanese yen and their two decades of ook? Or like, like how, how realistic, like what's, what's your scenario in, in comparison to that, your assessment? So, so I, well, I think first, I don't think that we can go from a world where we have 78 trillion of debt and only $4 trillion to, um, you know, citadels and we're all doing handstands, <laughs> you know, with Bitcoin, but yeah. that, that imbalance in the credit system, um, you know, I think sometimes people talk about debt jubilees and, you know, if you had dollar denominated debt, they're just going to print their way out of it. Well, again, you, you know, not really picking on Venezuela, but looking at it, when the currency deteriorates, that's the price that we all pay um, for years of prior kind of economic imbalance being sustained. So um, it's like, yeah, maybe people can pay their Venezuelan Boulevard denominated debt, but there isn't food on the grocery shelves uh, because the monetary medium isn't functioning anymore. So I, like, we can't go from a world where, um, like, when people, I think the an to answer your question most tangibly, when people have this impetus to repay debt and to shrink the credit system, that if the credit system is so large and it's so levered that every time it attempts to contract, it would lead to an utter collapse if the Fed didn't step in to provide more dollars. So I would take you back to my kind of the slide that has the wheel where it's too much debt, not enough dollars, add more dollars, create more debt, too much debt. Um, that each time the system tries to delever, it's the leverage profile that, that doesn't allow it to happen orderly. It actually causes it to, to start to happen in a very disorderly way. That's why if we look at March, again, you know, we went from liquid to illiquid and investment grade bonds traded off 25 points. Like it goes quickly and, and it's kind of, you know, it's an, it's an overused analogy, but it is the musical chairs um, where everyone's suspended in this state of hallucination or yeah, and then they figure it out everyone figures it out at the same time and they all hit the exits. And then the Fed has, again, I don't, I don't want to say have to, in their mind they have to step in to provide more dollars and they're all doing it to sustain that 78. Because the difference between the 78 and the four is so big um, that they're just, the four is the only thing that can be used to actually pay debts at the end of the day. Yes, in, the, in, the, in their view.
they don't have a choice. They're the the other way of letting the system restructure and and allow the debt to be reduced. It's it's only going to happen when their hand is forced, and that hand will be forced, in my view, by Bitcoin. Okay. Good.